The art of losing God's help in bringing you praise. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fade. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all faith. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice in. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in the word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you for the freedom to come boldly and praise your name, dear Lord. We just thank you for that we live in a country that we have that privilege and that honor to be able to praise you, dear Lord. And we do praise you today. We lift you up, dear Lord. We want to know more of you. We want to see more of you in our lives, in the lives of this world, dear Lord. And, and please receive all the honor and the glory today, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Karen? Does anybody know what today is? Sunday. Sunday. Very good. It's Vacation Bible School Day. Right. Woo! Day. So have fun. Well, one of the things that we're doing in Vacation Bible School is we're trying to raise money for Nets for Life. And if you want to know what a net is, what does anybody know what a net is? Has Miss Lois shared with you what a net is? You put it over your bed, right? Is that what they do when they sleep at night? Because mosquitoes come out at night, don't they? Some of you know what mosquitoes are, and they bite you. Well, we're raising nets to send over to other countries so that people can sleep, little kids can sleep at night and not have to worry about being bit by mosquitoes. But to make it fun, we're raising money, and it's the boys against the girls. And just because you're a girl doesn't mean you have to put it in the girl pot. You can put it in the boy pot, okay? And if you're a boy, you can put it in the girl pot. But as you can see, we have two very funny faces on this. Our pastors, okay? So, we're trying to see who's going to win, the boys or the girls. And whoever the winner is, gets to get a pie in their face. Woo! And we're going to have our pastor, our youth pastor, Steve, here, is going to be the one that gets to throw the pie. Or pie. Yay! Okay, so we want to come now, while the second song's playing, very quietly, and put your money in the bucket. So just remember, it's the boys versus the girls, but we would like to see pies thrown in both their faces, wouldn't we? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Who said that? Me. Within a dollar. Within a dollar. Within a dollar. Sorry. All right, so feel free as we get ready to sing our second praise song to come up and, and give for these nets for these children in our country. Sorry, hot. Amen. All right. <laughs> Like my granddaughter not to be on the internet, okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. And take time and be rich 
establish our relationship. Sometimes we walk in this world and things divide us, things separate us, things cause us to, to, to walk away from God or even walk away from church. But what we do today is what draws us in, what draws us back. I'd like to share just a little quick testimony. I had a, a telephone call a number of years ago. And a young lady called me up and said, Pastor Randy, can, can we talk? And I said, absolutely. I absolutely hadn't seen this beautiful gal in a couple of years. And went over and sat down and both of us weeping and crying. She said, I need to ask your forgiveness. And I'm like, for what? She said, it doesn't matter. You know, it was just things I had to name at you and some things. And she said, I just need to ask your forgiveness and you forgive me. I said, absolutely, man. Please forgive me. But obviously, I did some of those same things. <laughs> Her concern was she had not taken communion in like two years. And her big thing was that she had division between her and her pastor. She felt that she needed to get that right to draw her back in to the right place that she needed to be with God. That's communion. That's communion. It's not always the mistakes we make during the week or a uh, scowl on our face at someone. It's wanting to come back into that sweet fellowship with God and cutting down any barriers that keep you from fellowship. <coughs> Jesus gave us communion. And He gave us the reason why that He was going to die on the cross for us. He was going to shed His blood and give His body for us to make the way to heaven. When we come to take communion this morning, communion is open to, to everyone who believes, everyone who knows Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If you don't know Him, you don't understand, it's probably best that you, that you don't take that. But we can't make the determination only you can. But this is nothing that we take lightly as the Scripture says. This is a time that, that we draw towards God. We draw close to Him. We close our eyes. We communicate with Him to get things right. To, to, to draw back into that, that relationship with Him. In 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote, he says, For as I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord on the same night in which He was betrayed took bread. And when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, Take, hey, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup in an, of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. That's the word of God. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you now. Lord, search our hearts. Father, search our hearts. No one knows us better than you. You formed us. You made us. You molded us. You shaped us. Father, we know you as Lord and Savior. We have that relationship with you. But Father, as we draw near now to celebrate, to be reminded of Calvary, your body broken, your blood shed. Father, let us not take this lightly. Let us not take this as just another tradition of the church. But we take this as a worshipful lesson that you taught us to remember the sacrifice you gave for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> now these cups are the same ones that we had last time. There's a little wafers on top. Uh, Father, we just come before you. Father, we do give you thanks for this time. We do give you thanks that we can take this time, Lord, that, to be intimate with you. <coughs> Father, that we draw closer to you. Father, that to feel your presence, to commit your presence with thanksgiving. 
Father, I pray that all we do and say would always bring you honor and glory and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus said, take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He took the cup. He said, this is the covenant of my blood. The new covenant in my blood which was shed for you. It's all for you. Let's pray. Father, as we go into our service this morning, Father, I pray that we go into this service in a worshipful mode, Lord, that we can take some time, Lord, to leave the world on the outside, come inside to fellowship with you, Lord, that when we leave here, we can continue to fellowship with you on the outside. Lord, sometimes the world comes in and distracts us and trips us up. But Father, I pray that we take this time right now to commune with you, to fellowship with you, to draw closer to you, closer than we ever have. Speak to hearts, change lives, touch minds as only you can. We've also brings the message, Father, that again that we we be receptive, that we learn, that we would grow, that we be again drawn to you as only you can have us to be. We thank you for these saints, we thank you for Iron Faith Church in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. up here and uh, and preach the more I enjoy this um, it's growing me as I study to come up with these things it's building my relationship with the Lord as I trust in him to give me something to to preach about and as I get ready to, to do this message today I, I want to explain something to you in the script in the scriptures God tells us um, to not be ashamed of, of the gospel and to not be ashamed of who we are my desire as a pastor, as I grow, as I uh, as I grow as a pastor, is to make sure that I never water down the Word of God. The Word of God is what it is. It was intended to us, for us who believe in Him. It's offensive to those who do not believe it, but that's not my problem. God designed it that way. So, I, if you, I would ask you to hold me accountable. If you ever think I'm watering down or hear me watering down the gospel, I want you to let me know because I never want that to be a result of anything that I teach. This message today is going to be, I'm going to probably not be very popular by the time it's done, but what God put on my heart to talk about today was testing God. And we know that the word of God is infallible. Yes, it was written by man, but it was inspired by God. We talked about this the first week at the New Believers class. The Bible will never contradict itself. Scientists and people that don't believe try and say that the Scripture contradicts itself. But if you truly know the Word and read it, Old Testament and New, and you see all the prophecies that have come to be fulfilled, all the promises that have come to be fulfilled, God's Word is infallible. It's inerrant. It has no mistakes in it, and it doesn't contradict itself. But I'm going to, I want to take a look at a couple scriptures um, that may make it look so. Just to give you an idea of where the world sees, hey, the, the, the scriptures contradict themselves. What I want to talk about is testing God. If you'll turn, we'll start uh, in the Old Testament if you go to Deuteronomy. Chapter 6 and verse 16. And we know that these first five books of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy, are what are known as the books of the law. These were written during Moses' time when God was giving him the laws for the Jewish people of that time. The idea of the law was that God wanted his people to understand his desire for their life. At this time, they didn't have Jesus. 
didn't. They didn't have the Messiah like we do today. So they had laws. The intention wasn't for the laws to hinder you from doing stuff. The intention of the law was so that you would understand that God has desires for your life and he wants us to follow his plan so that we can receive the blessings that he has in store for us. But if we look at uh, chapter 6, verse 16, it says, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him in Massa. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes which he commanded you. Pretty self-explanatory. <clears throat> Don't test God and follow his commandments. That's what I just said, right? He wants us, he laid these things out for us and desires that we follow. So that scripture there would say what? That we're not supposed to test God. If you go into the New Testament, into Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 through 7, This is the story where uh, Jesus has been in the desert for 40 days, uh, fasting, no drinking, and Satan shows up and, and starts trying to test Jesus. If you look at starting in verse 5, it says, Then the devil took him to the holy city, that's Jesus, he went with Jesus to the holy city, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you were the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Verse 7, Jesus said to Satan, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Now this is Jesus telling Satan, you don't put God to the test. Another example of this is uh, if you want to look at it, is in Luke chapter 4, uh, verses 9 through 12. It's Luke's take of the same story. Uh, the Gospels are all different, uh, different takes of pretty much the same story. So you can see what we just looked at was Matthew's explanation of it. And if you want to look at those verses in Luke chapter 4, 9 through 12, we see Jesus make the statement again that we are not the to test or tempt the Lord our God. Now, if you'll go from Matthew, if you'll go back to the last book of the Old Te of the Old Testament, is Malachi, Malachi for the Italians. Malachi chapter three. We're going to look at verses 8 through 10. And if you look again, if you look at the title of this chapter, this chapter starts out, at least in, uh, in this uh, Bible, it says, Robbing God. <clears throat> Actually, you know what? I'm going to go back a little bit and start in verse 6. For I, the Lord, do not change, Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And therefore, put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you, and pour down for you a blessing, until there is no more need. Well, wait a minute, is that the scripture contradicting itself? We just read all the scriptures that said, 
We're not to test God. But here's God saying, go ahead and test me. That's where us as Christians have to face that battle out there. Well, you know, your Bible says this and then it says this. It's two different things. But we're going to take a look at that. If you look at the first few verses that we read, the desire there was man's desire. Right? Satan's telling Jesus, go ahead and do what you want to do. And the answer to that is don't test God. What that's telling us as believers is we're not supposed to go out there and say, well, I'm going to do this because God's going to back me up. That's testing God. But the thing that we originally are trying to do is our desire. We're going out there, we want to do something, but have faith that God's going to back it up. And the scriptures tell us, don't do that. That's us trying to test God. The difference in Malachi is God is saying, this is my desire for my people. Go ahead and do this to test to see what I will do. God desires to give us blessings beyond what we can even comprehend as long as we're doing what he wants to do. If we look at that scripture in Malachi, he gives the history of the Jewish people. He says, you've turned from me. You've gone against my commands throughout history. And I know the, the times that I've been up here preaching, I've talked about that a lot. Remember I talked about that roller coaster ride? I did it uh, where, you know, God would send somebody to deliver the Jews. Things would be great. When things went easy, they'd start saying, all right, I got this. And then it would go back down. Well, here God is talking about it again. You've broke my commands. He says, all I want from you is to trust in the commands that I gave you and see what, I'm, what I'll do for you. But he, his call is for us to be obedient first in order to receive those blessings. When we test him of our own desires, we're doing our own thing and saying that, well, he'll bless us for it because this is what I want. His promise is that he'll bless us when we're abiding in what he wants. In this particular uh, scripture here, he's talking about their giving. This is where it gets very unpopular in the pulpit. One of the things that we're called to do is to tithe. The word tithe is the tenth. God desires that we give one-tenth of our, in this instance with tithing, income to the church to advance his kingdom. We have other, there are other things where, I mean, we obviously have the Ten Commandments. We have commands from them. And here's another place with tithing because, you know, the scripture says, people say, use that old saying that money is the root of all evil. That's not what the scripture says. The scripture says the money is a root of all evil. If money was the root of all evil, God would have us have nothing to do with money. He wouldn't expect it from us. And he wouldn't bless us with it. So it's very, that's another situation there where the scripture gets taken out of context. It's a root of all evil. Money is a manly desire. And we all have encountered people that are all about money. There's people out there that are like that. They worked hard for it. I'm not taking that away from them. But the call that we have here is to, to tithe. God is saying to them, my storehouse, needs, I want you to go ahead and fill my storehouse and see what I can do with that. I actually, when I was researching this, I have found articles from supposedly theologians that said that this tithing doesn't apply to us. That Jesus never tithed. We don't know that. The scriptures may not tell us that Jesus tithed, but the scriptures don't tell us everything that happened in the entire course of history to everybody that's in the Bible. God gave us the information that he wanted us to have in, this, in these 66 books. So I started I'm thinking, okay, well, this guy's a theologian. He's smarter than I am. So let me see if what God's put on my heart to preach about is really not in the scriptures. 
I went, to, I went ahead and read his article. And again, this is a published theologian saying that tithing is not important anymore, that that was an Old Testament thing, and that it was a law. To me, this doesn't read that that's a law. I don't think one of the Ten Commandments is to give, has anything to do with tithing. But this, here's this guy. Now, here's this guy that's out there probably in front of a congregation teaching his flock that the Scripture doesn't say that. He's adding, in my opinion, he's adding things to the Scripture. He says that the tithing doesn't matter anymore, that that was an Old Testament thing, and Jesus came and abolished the law. I thought, wow, maybe, maybe I'm going to have to, to re-guess my, re-figure out my sermon. <clears throat> But when I started looking at it, I think, now again, I'm not going to question this guy. He's got degrees and all that stuff. But I think he's misunderstanding what God's word is saying here. Because the idea of the tithing isn't that God needs the money. The idea of the tithing is that God wants us to be faithful. For us to be committed to him so that we can receive his blessings. When, this, when this, the, this article that I read from this particular theologian um, said that Jesus, that the law is no more because Jesus abolished the law, I'd like to read Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. If, you don't have to go there. If you'd like to, you can. But this is exactly what I talked about with people saying that money is the root of all evil. And that's not what it says. That one little word. Money is a root of all evil. When you change it to the, it changes the entire outlook of the scripture. Does it not? So I took what this theologian said. Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. <laughs> Don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. That's what this theologian just said, that Jesus came to abolish the law. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So what's the difference? There we are again, taking that one word, abolish, or fulfill. It changes the whole concept of that scripture. Jesus fulfilled the law because in the time of the law, they didn't have a Messiah. They didn't have a, an intercessor between them and God other than the prophets. So what did they have to do in Old Testament times to, to abide by the law? They, ha they had to make sacrifices. They had to have rituals. They had to go to the temple and, and watch, uh, give all kinds of sacrifices. When I was studying the Old Testament and saw all the different ways, you know, you think sacrifice, you go, you take an apple. Boy, they had all kinds of sacrifices. Grain offerings, uh, animal offerings, everything. I was like, wow, that's how ritualistic the law was. But that was them abiding by God's command for them at that time to keep their relationship with God. We now have the Messiah. He came and he fulfilled the law. That means that no longer do we have to run a goat to the, to the church, cut it in half, pour the blood all over the walls, walk between the two halves. Jesus did that for us on the cross. He is our lamb. He is the one that got slaughtered for us. So he's not saying that I abolish the law because if he says I abolish the law, then that means that all that Old Testament stuff was not of God. Because God's the same, what, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He says in that verse in Malachi we looked at, I haven't changed. And because I don't change, that's why you have not been consumed. You know how far back that one verse goes? All the way back to Moses. God made a promise that he was going to bring the Jewish people out of Egypt. He made a promise that he was going to give them that promised land that they have when they broke up into the 12 tribes. 
They, okay, God, we're with you. Okay, God, we don't know you. Okay, God, we're with you. Okay, God, we don't know you. We're going to do it our way. So many times in the Old Testament it says they did what was right in their own eyes. And that's when stuff got bad. And then they turned back to the Lord. God didn't change. If God had changed and said, you know what, I'm tired of you guys disappointing me or disobeying me, I'm going to cut you loose. They'd have been consumed by Canaanites, by all the armies that were bigger than them, were stronger than them, had more land than them, came in to take everything they wanted. And those, those armies of Judah and Israel stood up and fought against them because God didn't change, said, I'm going to keep you safe. I'm going to give you this land. You're going to come in here and you're going to have your own place. And all that happened. That's the only reason that the Jews survived all those times of disobedience. Because God promised them that. <clears throat> now when we look in, in, in Malachi, and he says, I want you to bring your offerings. I want you to bring them to me so that my storehouse is full. That means God wants us to bring our, and not, not just money. He wants our hearts. He wants our time. He wants us to help out with the church. This particular thing he's talking about here is money. You come and fill my storehouse so that he can do what he needs to do. And he says, I will open up the gates of heaven and give you more than your storehouses can fill, can hold. What kind of promise is that? I want that. Does anybody else want that promise? You want all your needs to be met and be fulfilled? But he wants something from us first. And like I said, talking about the giving of money is hard. Uh, I've been in churches where pastors have talked about it, and I've heard the rumblings after the service. Rick and I and pastor have talked for quite a while about this because... Uh, this church is not a rich church. We've Obviously, you know, we've been talking about wanting to get a building, wanting to rent a building, do this, do that. But when we sit down and look at the books, we don't have the means to do that. doesn't mean that God's not going to provide it or that we haven't lost the faith that if, if we all truly believe, whether the books show it or not, that God wants us in that building, we're going to that building because God's going to provide it. That's a promise. But we have to be doing what he wants us to do first. <clears throat> I, Chris and I have been throughout our lives, <clears throat> have been in spots where we give way more than, than 10% because we know the hard times are coming. And we've had times where we haven't given that 10%. And things were a mess. And we finally sat down and said, we got to do this. First things first, we have to give the money to the church. Makes no sense on paper. Like, where are we going to get it? We have this bill, we have that bill. And as sure as I'm standing here before you today, and my wife will tell you the same thing as she sits back there getting ready to cry. We start tithing, and everything else works out. When I went to get in the union that I'm in, I was an auto mechanic for 20 years. Lost my business, almost went bankrupt, probably should have filed bankruptcy. Lost my gas station, got in this union that I was going in. Here we are in bankruptcy, and I'm going from, I forget, $18 an hour as a mechanic to $14.30 in the apprenticeship, to start the apprenticeship. Made no sense. Here we are, struggling, trying to pay people that we owe from when we lost the gas station, and I'm going to switch careers at 36 years old and take a cut and pay. We prayed about that situation and we never once, never once did God put a doubt on our hearts. That is truly, I, I'm going to be honest with you, in all the years that I've been saved, that is the first decision that I've made where I've had that peace of God that everybody tells you you can have. We kept, look, we tried to talk ourselves out of it. There's no way we can do this. There's no way we can do this. And at the end of the day, we were totally at peace. And you know what God did? I got in that union, 
and for the first year and a half until I got my first raise, my first year and a half, I worked five tens and made more money than I did as an auto mechanic. That has nothing, that's just God's provision. Did I have to work for it? Yes. Instead of working eight to five Monday to Friday, I had to work 10 hours a day and a Saturday. I had to put the extra time in, but you know what? God provided. And never once did we feel that hit of getting into the union that we're in now. So if you're making the I, I, I can't explain it to you because it's not of us, it's of God. You just get that peace. I heard people, you know, that I've known, my brother, my parent, I've heard people talk about, oh, I was in absolute peace with this decision. And I would make decisions and be like, yeah, I'm in absolute peace with this. Yeah. And then when I went to bed, I'm like, I'm not in absolute peace with this. Who am I trying to kid? I just didn't want to tell them I wasn't in absolute peace with it. And we had that peace. I felt it. Never a doubt. Made no sense according to man. According to man's money, it made no sense that she and I would make this move at that point in our lives, at that age. But because we knew that it was God instructing us to do it, he saw us through that. My sister, my uh, sister Kim has been in the same situation. She gave a testimony at our old church about it. And uh, I'm going to cut this, cut this short, and we're going to have uh, Brother Rick's going to come up and give his testimony uh, about this. But I, I just, it's an uncomfortable thing to talk about, about giving 10% of your income to the church. It's uncomfortable. But I, that's why I said when I started, I am not going to water down the word of God. This might make me unpopular with you. You might not like the fact that we talked about this today. But God's just asking us, just do it and see what I'm going to do for you. So my challenge is, I don't know anybody's financial situation. I don't. All I'm telling you is what the word of God says. This church wants to advance the kingdom of God. It was so cool to me. Last week, Sister Deb puts on Facebook, hey, who's ready to go back and help with Hurricane Sandy rebuilding? For those of you that weren't here, this church wasn't but three months old, four months old, and we started a disaster relief team. Rick, Sister Deb, uh, Jake went over, my daughter Ashley went over, Larry and Laurel went over. We, we at the time were having 16 to 20 people attend, attend service, and we end up with 10, 12 people go over to start tearing down the homes that Hurricane Sandy destroyed. From a leadership perspective, that was the coolest thing that we've ever seen, was this tiny little church just, just sprouted out of its shell, traveling over to Seaside Heights to help people that are down and out because of Hurricane Sandy. And now, last week, I saw Deb put a thing, hey, who's up for going back to rebuild? That's having a heart for Christ. That's answering what Christ challenges you to do and doing it. And how much blessing did we all get out of those trips over there? All, we, all these people, I only went over once. Uh, you guys went five, six times, correct? The disaster relief team? Just following what God did, called them to do and the blessings that they got out of it were unbelievable. They saw somebody come to know Christ through them being there doing the work. That's another situation where God just wants you to do what he calls you to do. He calls us all to do different things. The subject I chose today was about giving. Because I've seen it, I felt it, I lived it. And it's hard to say, you know what, before I pay any other bills, I'm taking 10% and giving it to Iron Faith Fellowship. Or splitting it between Iron Faith Fellowship and any missionaries that you might support. Any children that you might support through Compassion International or any of those great organizations that are out there feeding third world kids. That's part of your giving. But if I could challenge you today as my family would be if, if to really pray about your giving because Chris and I have been through it and we've been blessed through it. Brother Rick's going to come up and tell you how it's affected his life. God, he told you, I don't change. If I had changed, what would have happened to the Jews? They'd have been consumed. So trust me, you put out the effort and just watch and see what it is that I'm going to do to bless you. 
I'm going to pray to close, and then we'll have Pastor Rick come up, or Brother Rick come up and do his, do his testimony. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you as we open up your word again, Lord. Father, that we seek what it is that you desire for us, Father, that we not put our own intentions, our own desires, our own needs into your word. Father, may we search it, may we absorb it, may we live it to the best that you enable us to live it, Father, that we can receive those blessings that you promise us. Thank you for all that are here today, Father. Thank you again, just for, I thank you for the opportunity to get up here and preach and to share what it is that you've put on my heart. I pray, Lord, that one person leaves here today changed, either because of the worship, because of the fellowship, or because of the message. Just one person, Father, leave this place changed today because of you being here in our presence. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning again, and uh, you know, I talked to Pastor Randy several months about, ago about this, and, uh, and he reminded me of a time that, uh, quite frankly, I'd like to forget about. So would my wife, because we did go through bankruptcy. And when we did, I, you know, you have people pouring over all your financial records, looking to see if you've hidden money so that you can get out of paying your bills. They're basically calling you dishonest right off the get-go and they want to look. One of the things I knew from being a deacon in that church and a board member was that the government was very particular about giving to church when you filed bankruptcy. And but what the scripture tells me is to pay attention to the government law unless it contradicts God's law, what the church says. So we, every week before I went grocery shopping, I would take 10% and get 10% more in cash because the credit cards were gone. You didn't go grocery shopping and just pay the bill at the end with a credit card. You had to have money, so you bought your necessities, but we got, we always set aside 10% to give in cash because that's what God called us to do. And the blessings he poured out upon us is God says he'll never leave a righteous man begging. And if I ever thought I'd have to beg, it wasn't that time. But we had my sister-in-law stepped up and said, while you're looking for work, while you don't have much coming in, I'll help you pay your household expenses. God didn't leave us begging. One Sunday, I walked into church, and the treasurer came up to me and handed me an envelope with a check in it, and I about tore his head off because I was still a board member. I said, who approved this? <laughs> Stupid question, I was going to approve the church giving to me, right? <laughs> but I like the tour's head off, but again, God never left us begging. We continued to give 10%. Um, one time, I ran ahead of God, and I went to an uncle who I knew had lent money to many of my other nephews and my nieces, and he was just a generous guy and asked him for a couple hundred dollars just from one paycheck to the other. See, what I had forgotten because I got worried all about finances is that I had worked overtime, that Sherry had worked overtime. When it came to that Friday, we had enough money to pay our bills. And he had said no to me. And what I had totally forgotten about and the next time I went to see him, what he told me was, there's a savings account in this bank with your name on it. Here's the checkbook. Get what you need. Get what you need. And you know, this is about finance, but it's not all about finance. See, the majority of what caused our bankruptcy was our warehouse flooding. We had a small furniture store. 
So I called my older brother and I said, look, if my, my nephews, my niece, if you want to come up, anything in the store, I'm going to have to sell for 10 cents on the dollar. Why don't you just come up and pick what you want and I'll bring it down in the delivery truck. Well, they did that. The day I was supposed to deliver things to my nephew's house, I called him before I left Wilmington. They lived outside of Baltimore. And he answered the phone and he said, yep, I'm awake, I'm ready. Well, what I didn't know was that he had a drug problem. He was addicted to painkillers. And when I got there, he was unconscious and non-responsive. I had to go into the door through the house through the back door. And God used me to save his life. That nephew's married now, has two beautiful children. And by the way, I led him, I was privileged to lead him to the Lord when he graduated high school. But these are the kind of blessings that God pours out. Don't just don't think of it as, if I give 10%, God's going to give this much money back to me. That's not the important part. God's poured out his blessings not only in that way when we recently visited with them, but we just celebrated, my wife and I just celebrated 25 years of marriage. A lot of people don't do that. They might celebrate 25 years of marriage, but it's not with the same person. So God continues to pour out blessings. I, I had the job that I'm working at now before I even filled out the paperwork. The manager at the time kept sending messages to me through my stepson, come, I want you to work for me, come, I want you to work for me, and eventually I did. Um, and God continues to pour out the blessings today. We just, it's amazing what God does, and it's, like I say, it's, it, don't look for blessings to come. It's not a financial re reward thing. If you give 10%, I'm going to give. It's not an investment. It's an inve it is an investment because what you give here, you'll find out when we walk along those streets of gold, when people are walking up to you and saying, that missionary you supported is why I'm here today. Just like when we went over to Hurricane Sandy Relief and Dennis got saved the day we were there, there was a man that was bitter and, and very condemning of where they were putting trash from their neighbor's house. And one person said, here's my phone number, call me if you need to talk. And we were privileged to be there the day he was saved. I talked with him before he got saved. And that's the kind of blessings. You'll see when you're in heaven, when people walk up to you and you don't recognize their faces, and they'll say, that missionary led me to the Lord because you made it possible for him to be in this country where I grew up. That's the blessings. They're far greater than anything we have here on earth. So thank you for listening to me. And uh, I'm going to give it back to Hoss. our last worship song, take our offering, and then a reminder that we have the uh, congregational meeting after church to go over the new officers and uh, that stuff. We will try and make it as fluid as possible so that we don't take all of your day, but we do need, this is the stuff that we need to uh, take care of as members. We have, do we have ushers, Trap? Sure. How about that? All right, that works. Just, just stepping up to serve, that's so awesome. All right, let's pray. Father God, as we get ready to take our offering, Lord, we just pray that our giving is from the right spirit, from the right mind, Lord. That you take the leaders of this church, Father, and show them exactly where it is that you would like us to expand our ministry and to continue to grow our ministry. 
We thank you for the opportunity to even be here today to give back a small portion, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Oh, oh. 